Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for inviting me here to speak to you today about the University of Strathclyde and our, um, how we communicate the messages of, um, a, of Strathclyde. Um, we've had some success over the past few years, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and um, I will talk a bit about myself, a bit about how I understand storytelling, how I understand the media, and how I've applied that um, to the University of Strathclyde over the past few years and to uh, another university also. Um, so essentially what I'm here to talk to you about, if, there was, if suddenly I had to get off the stage and I had 10 seconds uh, to leave the stage, um, I could sum up what I'm going to say in five words, five simple words, which I'm not going to tell you what they are yet, I'll tell you further into the presentation, um, but it's five words which really have been powering everything that we've been doing at the University of Strathclyde for many years, um, with notable success over the past three or four years. Um, these awards, as you can see here, the, uh, are industry uh, engagement activities, some of the, the best in the UK. These are some of the centres where we do that, industry engagement activity. Some of our, our research, and uh, obviously our engagement with students and our working with um, our teaching and passing on knowledge to the future generation, and that's some of our graduates from last, um, last summer, um, enjoying their day in Glasgow. So the University of Strathclyde is based in Glasgow, and um, it is a... Um, the second, there are, there's obviously there's the University of Glasgow, which is in Glasgow, and then there's the University of Strathclyde. So um, we are based in Scotland, which is part of the UK, and there are 120 uh, universities in, in the UK. So it's a very crowded market. And so what we have to do is try and work out how to communicate what we do and let people know of uh, the successes at the university. And over the past few years, um, these are three very key, very obvious examples of that success. Um, the university, um, the Times Higher Education uh, Supplement in the UK runs a prestigious uh, award ceremony every year and all the uh, higher education institutions in the UK um, uh, put forward the nominations for it and um, in 2011 we were named, we, we won Research Project of the Year. In 2012 we won University of the Year for the whole of the UK and in 2013, we won a Entrepreneurial University of the Year. So they are the three awards. That's the, the most obvious example of, um, of the uh, success at storytelling and the way that we present ourselves um, over the past few years. Um, so that's me, I'm Ray McHugh. I'm, in the programme, it says I'm Head of Media and Corporate Communications. Since the programme was printed, I've actually um, I've moved on to this position, Director of Marketing and development, and I appreciate the fact that I can talk to you in English today. Um, um, I, um, the, I understand obviously the rest of the presentations are in Swedish, so I really appreciate being able to speak in English. Now the problem with me and English is um, people from Glasgow tend to talk very quickly. Um, and people from, uh, and, and so if I was talking to a Scottish audience, I would probably be talking a bit more like this, a bit more quickly, and you wouldn't really maybe quite understand quite what I was saying, you maybe get every word here or there. So I have to slow down. And if I was talking to my family, forget it. And the problem I have here is um, the more passionate I am about a subject, the quicker I talk. And I'm very passionate about communicating the wealth of knowledge in a university and the importance of um, science and technology and engineering and how the, um, the, the general population who are not so closely associated with it as, as we are, um, how they should understand the importance of science and of engineering and of innovation and technology. So um, I was uh, looking for um, connections between Strathclyde, the university, and Sweden. Um, and I did have a, I had a quite a, a slight, a very trivial example of uh, this man here, Henrik Larsson, the now retired Swedish footballer, um, who spent um, a number of years in Glasgow playing for Celtic. Now that's not the connection between Strathclyde um, and uh, in 2005, we actually gave him an honorary degree for his work for sport and for charity. So he's a, he is a, a University of Strathclyde graduate. Now, that was what I was going to say. But when I landed at the airport uh, last night, I saw this. Two, um, a fantastic display at the airport of uh, engineering um, and innovation from Volvo, presented as you in the baggage arrival area. 
Um, uh, almost like a museum, this fantastic engine and a whole and a chassis next to it and a whole the, the power of Volvo. And I thought, actually, that's a connection between Strathclyde and, uh, and, uh, and Sweden, and particularly Gothenburg, is the Scottish innovation and Scottish engineering is a great tradition at Strathclyde and across all of, of Scotland and the UK. Um, I mean, I could stand here for the rest of the afternoon giving you some of the inventions that the, the Scots came up with. Um, we invented the bike, um, and when you want to put a tyre on it, we invented the pneumatic tyre. And if you want to go out cycling on your bike with a pneumatic tyre in the rain, as it is today, we invented the Macintosh raincoat. So you can go on and on and on about this, uh, the innovation. So I, I realise that that's actually the connection between um, Sweden and Scotland, is the, the fact that there's such tremendous, tremendous innovation in Sweden and the fact that you're proud of it and you're displaying it right as you arrive here in Gothenburg in the, um, in the arrivals hall. So, like Henrik Larsson, I am a Strathclyde graduate. And that's me 20 years ago with my Harry Potter glasses, before Harry Potter had them, um, at a, my graduation ceremony, or after my graduation ceremony. I'm a Strathclyde Business School graduate uh, in marketing, um, and I spent 20 years in communication. So after I graduated, I decided not to follow a pure marketing career. I moved into the world of newspapers, and that's my uh, proof, that's my press card from um, from 1994 um, and uh, ran out in 2003. I got another one after that. Um, and uh, I, that's when I began my relationship with storytelling and understanding how stories power everything that we do. All communication is based on stories. So you can talk about all these, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all these, you know, YouTube, fantastic technologies these days, but if you've got nothing to say, there is no point in having these technologies. So it's all about the power of the story. Um, and I worked at these two uh, local newspapers, um, which was an experience. Um, I became editor of the Glaswegian newspaper. Um, and uh, there, again, you see every day, it's story, stories, stories. It's like a machine, just power of stories every day. And then after leaving the Glaswegian, I moved to this, the Daily Record, a red-top tabloid in Glasgow, where, now, if you're aware of the media in the UK, the, the tabloid newspapers are have been under quite a lot of attack recently. Uh, in most cases, fairly. Um, but from a communications perspective, the, the, the fuel to a red top tabloid is stories. Whether they are serious, trivial, it's all about what is, <coughs> what is a story. How do we, um, how do we communicate that idea to, from one person to another? And that, working in that environment for 12 years um, really sharpened my understanding of storytelling and something that I've applied um, in my higher education career. Now. It may be a hugely important story of that nature. It may be politics. It may be sport. Um, it's stories to bind all these things together. And then, it's true to my tabloid tradition, it might be a man getting his head stuck in a bin. Because people ask me, what is a story? And the thing is, the, the simple way to remember it is, or the way I use, is um, whether it's something you want to tell a friend over a coffee or over a meal. You say, oh, did you hear about this? And whether it's something of a you know, tragic uh, geopolitical scale or something that's you know, a lot more trivial, it's, you know, this kind of story was an internet sensation last year in Aberdeen because people wanted, well, they wanted to know why, what, what happened. Well, the answer is, I was looking for my hat. <laughs> so it's the stories that bind all these things together. Um, so after 12 years in media and understanding sharpening that, I moved to this place here, the University of Glasgow, founded in 1451. Um, and as you can see by the building, that's the, the Gilbert Scott building, a very um, ancient university, um, one of the ancient universities in the UK, a tremendous seat of learning, and um, a place that I found that storytelling wasn't really as sharp as it could have been. Um, I was responsible for communicating their medical research, their biomedical research, um, veterinary medicine, and uh, a treasure trove of stories. It was fantastic. You go in and you would find all these amazing things to do. <coughs> but what I found uh, was sometimes you would come up against a barrier in terms of how you tell that story in the modern media um, and the attitudes within that place sometimes. Um, I'll tell you a story. Once I was, uh, I, was trying, I was writing a press release for a researcher um, who was, um, he was publishing a, journal, a, pa a paper in a journal, so there was a deadline, and I was, I'd emailed him and phoned him and hadn't gotten a response and emailed him. And I, I eventually got hold of him on the phone and I said, do you realise we need to get this thing out? And he said to me, Mr McHugh, this university was founded the year Christopher Columbus was born. We didn't get where we are today by, slowly, by hurrying things up. 
So that was something. That was, that was a very rare attitude, but it was very insightful in terms of the way that modern technology and modern communication, and sometimes in universities, um, the way that we communicate, um, there's a bit of a clash. So after five years at that place, I moved here. It's the University of Strathclyde. Even by looking at it, you can tell the difference between the two institutions. Both based in the, in the same city, but both doing completely different things. Um, and I've been there for three years, um, and um, we have found that I've got a lot, we have a lot of stories to tell. And uh, when, I was, so when I joined Strathclyde, I met this man here, who's Professor uh, Sir Jim MacDonald, and I'll tell you a bit more about him later on. What I will do is I'll rewind 218, no, 218 years back to this man here, Professor John Anderson. Um, and this is kind of where the storytelling of Strathclyde begins. Uh, John Anderson was a professor of natural philosophy at the University of Glasgow. And he liked the idea of open learning, of not having barriers around the university and of spreading knowledge and spreading. Um, so in his will, which is there, um, he wrote that he wanted to establish a new place of learning. Not knowledge for knowledge's sake. We must make a difference and benefit mankind. And what he gave us was those five words that I mentioned at the start. And in this age of technology and digital and Facebook, etc., uh, written in ink on a, with a quill on a bit of dusty old paper was the, were the five words which uh, really power everything that Strathclyde does. And those five words are a place of useful learning. He wanted to establish a new university in Glasgow, uh, which was to be a place of useful learning. Um, and I, we say that the, we could go to every brand consultancy on the globe today, and they wouldn't give us a better strap line, a better uh, focus than that. The play, those five simple words that powers everything that we do and focuses our minds on how we interact with the world and how we communicate the work that we're doing. So. It's a line that we use all over the place. So in all of these things, you might not be able to see this at the back. You know, we, put the play, we took it from a place of useful learning to the place. We turned it into the definitive article. So the place of useful learning on the back of our publications on my business card here. It's on there. That's not a particularly great photo. So I took these photographs with my phone last week as I was walking about the campus. These are our uh, campus screens, the place of useful learning. So it's everywhere. Everybody understands it. Everybody buys into it, whether they're academic staff, non-academic staff, students. I was actually in a shoe shop two weeks ago. And uh, I was looking at a pair of shoes, and the, um, the person who was serving me said, oh, where is it you work? And I said, I work at Strathclyde University. And he said, oh, the place of useful learning. And I thought, oof, that, that is power, in that this man had no association whatsoever with the university. He just understood. He got what we were doing. I thought, well, we're doing a pretty good job there, if he understands that. And it's all down to John Anderson and his idea of useful learning and, and openness. Um, what I'll do is I'll give you a quick uh, whiz through, they're deliberately out of focus, a quick whiz through six people we talk about in our stories quite a lot um, and uh, who display the power of useful learning um, over the years. The first one there is George Birkbeck and he was a mechanical engineer. He founded the Institute of Mechanical Engineers in London and he's a, in a college in the University of London is named after him. But he started off at the university um, giving free public lectures to everybody, you know, the poor, women, everybody, they didn't care in 1800s. Um, and uh, so he is one of the kind of first proponents of this idea of open, useful learning for everybody. Next there is Thomas Graham, uh, whose work in the diffusion of gases is still used today, um, his pioneering work. Next one here, a slightly austere looking gentleman with the beard, um, is James Blythe. And there's a real strong link between what James Blythe did and what we do at Strathclyde today. James Blythe uh, developed an, uh, the world's first working wind turbine. And he put it on his holiday home in Mary, Mary Kirk near Aberdeen. Um, and anyone who knows anything about Strathclyde now knows we're very strong on renewable energy, green energy. Um, so the idea of having this kind of linear uh, connection back to the person who first developed it is very powerful for us. The next one is James Paraffin Young, the father of the petrochemical industry. Um, and again, a strong link with a lot of the work that we do today in energy is around oil and gas. We're launching a new oil and gas institute in a few months at, uh, at Strathclyde. And again, this, uh, this link from the past to the present. This one here, this is James Crow. He's my favorite of them all. James Crow was a janitor at the university. Um, and he applied for a job there because he wanted access to the library. He wanted access to the books. So he would clean the university by night. And uh, during the day, he could use the books in the library. <coughs> and he was the first. Uh, he then used to write scientific papers, you know, as, still as a janitor, and send them to the uh, publications in London. 
And he was the first person to put forward the idea of the Earth going into deep freeze of ice ages. He ended up as a fellow of the Royal Society and is, it was the pioneer of the idea of the Earth temperature variance over <coughs> huge periods of time. So he's the first the sort of father of the idea of the ice age, all from when he, be, he actually started off as a janitor. And then here, John Logie Baird, um, yet another Scottish invention in television. Um, and he was an electrical engineer at Strathclyde. Um, so this slide here, that shows the genesis of Strathclyde. It's not, I'm not expecting you to take in very much of that, but it shows that we started as Anderson's institution, then became Anderson's University. Then there was an objection to um, the, uh, the, the name of the, the, the use of the word university, possibly by another institution in Scotland. <clears throat> so we became Anderson's College, then we moved through the ages, became the Royal College of Science and Technology, until in a 1964, we were granted a royal charter by Her Majesty the Queen uh, to become an official university. Um, so that's the royal charter in 1964. And those of you that can count, which I'm sure is all of you, realise we're actually celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And that's the logo that we're using this year for our 50th anniversary celebrations. Um, again, the words useful learning are in there. So it's, it's um, about, we've had a royal charter since 1964, but we're, we're involved with useful learning. Um, since 1796. So that's the idea of where um, we are going. So, um, fast forward now from this sort of uh, 50 years ago to today, to back to this gentleman, Professor Sir Jim MacDonald. He's an electrical engineer and an incredible, um, a great, incredible person to work with. Um, he became principal in 2009, but he'd spent much of his academic life at Strathclyde, so he understands the idea of useful learning. He understands what the university is all about. Um, and he um, was an undergraduate, a postgraduate. He spent some time working in, indus in industry in Rolls-Royce, and he holds the Rolls-Royce chair professorship in power, electrical power systems at the university. So he's an active researcher, but also a principal. And what he did is he refocused what we were talking, uh, what we, the university was talking about around uh, this idea of useful learning, but working uh, on technology, innovation, and working with partners to boost the economy as much as he could. So I'll put this up. This is something that means a lot to me, will mean nothing to you. That's kind of essentially our strategy um, in one slide. Um, and I'm not expecting you to read it all. But there we have the leading international technological university, and that's the vision that Jim has for the, the, for the institution. And there it is there, useful learning, sitting right up at the top. So it's everywhere. It's all what we're still talking about back in 1796, all the way back. Um, so those of you who know anything about um, a books in terms of communication, Made to Stick is one that we in the communications office at the university are, are big fans of. Um, this idea of, uh, of why ideas are sticky by Chip and Dan Heath. Why some ideas just hang around and stories go on and generation to generation and why some ideas just wither and die. Um, and to, you know, to take the two ideas from that really is the place of useful learning for us is our sticky idea. It's the idea that just has been there since 1796 and has not gone away, it's just, it's, it's just been reinvented and repackaged for the future. And then the idea then from the previous slide of the leading international technological university, that is what in this book they call the commander's intent. So if you have a, a, an army going into battle, the commander doesn't say, here is a list of, a, of instructions for the army to take. You know, if, you want to, if the instruction is take the high ground, it's not go down the road, turn left, turn right, do this, you know, because things change when you go into battle. But the understanding of the army is that the commander's intent is take the high ground or take the bridge. Um, so what Jim has done with this uh, leading international technological university, combined with useful learning, is has this commander's intent that allows us, to, gives us a flexibility as a university to be responsive to the needs of industry uh, and of business and of government. So um, industrial engagement is, where the, is where the, one of the big things that we, uh, we are involved with at the university, and that is uh, when there are three awards. The middle one, the University of the Year, was built around this idea of industrial engagement. Um, so I'll just give you a quick flavour of some of our industrial partners. It may take a wee bit of time. Are we nearly there yet? And yeah. So all these industrial partners work in a whole range of sectors, all working with their academics on uh, innovation and moving, their techno moving technologies forward. Um, so you've got all these industrial partners. And on the other side of things, you've got government. And in their case, we've got you know, the UK government, we've got the Department for Business and Innovation and Skills, which is responsible for universities, but also responsible for the innovation um, network. 
very important part. We've got the Scottish Government, because as you'll be aware, um, Scotland is a devolved government. Um, Post-September the 18th this year, we may have a completely independent government, but that's uh, another debate. Um, we have obviously the European dimension, and then this here is the uh, Glasgow City Council uh, logo. So we work very um, closely with our, um, our local partners in government. Um, and so if you overlay the two of them, you get all your, that, it becomes a bit of a mess. It's just like, oh, how, do we, how do we deal with that? How do we work with industry? How do we work with government? How do we keep everybody happy? How do we progress the university? And how do we communicate it? So what we do is, you've got the university in the middle, we group these um, uh, organisations into their particular sectors, as we do here. There are some, these ones, are, I'll, talk, I'll refer to these, uh, we're in particular in a, in a minute. Um, and then on the other side, so you've got, sorry, you've got the, um, the, the needs of the, of the industrial partners feeding into the university. And then what you have is on the other side, government, and then their needs feeding in there. Um, and essentially what that really is, is this triple helix the idea of government, academia, and uh, industry working together for the common good. And I believe that this, this science park where we are just now is uh, an area. This is um, it, 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 this triple helix idea sort of fuels what, the, what happens here. So it's uh, very apt um, that this science park um, is playing host today to this, because this is very much what Strathclyde does. Um, and we're not the only ones doing that, but we are particularly good at it. Um, and I'll show you the reason we're good at it, and I apologize beforehand for the slide. That, from a communicator's perspective, that makes me shudder. But from inside the university, I understand what that means. And really, what the, the key thing here is this bit, this bit along the bottom. These are the different models that we have for working with business and industry. And up here, we have our, uh, our faculties. So what we, the flexibility I was talking about is that if an industry comes to us and says we want to work on particular technology, we don't say, well, you must work this way or you must work that way. We say, well, is it you want to, how do you want to work? How do you want to have a relationship with us? Um, so it may be a single organization engagement. Um, so this is WEIR. They just want to work with our engineering engineers on a one-to-one -one basis. They just want straightforward um, research and development work that they're doing together. So that's WEIR there. Um, all the way around down to here, which is, this is a center for manufacturing and crystallization, which is pharmaceutical um, industry working together at a pre-competitive stage. So it's unusual for AstraZeneca and GlaxoSmithKline uh, Smith to work together, but they do here with ourselves and with other universities. So this is, this is the kind of key bit to that. Um, but again, I do apologize for that. What is slightly nicer about it is this is how we actually present it to the world. We have these um, centers, uh, industry-facing centers, and from a communications perspective, we give them their own brand, um, their own colors, and we kind of start to you know, develop their own key messages for each of them. So at the very top, and, and the photograph at the top there, is our Technology and Innovation Center. It's a 90 million pound building being constructed in uh, the heart of our campus at the moment. And in there, much of our industry and business engagement work is going to happen. Researchers working with um, industrial partners and government in that building. The next photograph down is the next, is the next logo down, the Advanced Forming Research Center. So that's where Boeing and, and Rolls-Royce and Barnes Aerospace work with our researchers on essentially what we say about them is they bend bits of metal to keep planes in the air more efficiently. Um, that's kind of simple message we try and put around about that. Um, and then the bottom photograph is the Power Network Demonstration Centre where our energy partners work. Um, so when you have a physical building, it's helpful. When you have a nice logo, it's helpful. Then there's the, the blue one, which is the Weir Advanced Research Centre, the Weir group we were telling you, I was talking about a moment ago. They're going to find themselves in the, or they're going to go into the Technology and Innovation Centre at the top. And at the bottom, not to forget, um, it's not all about the engagement we do. It's not all about finding technology and, 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 uh, and um, uh, solutions. It's actually about the policy around it, how technology influences public life. So that's the international. So that, there, that's just a selection. We've got, an absolute, we've got a load more of them um, and because we're working in a range of ways with business and industry. And then to simplify it even more, what we do is we talk about the sectors because that's actually the easiest way of communicating the impact. So whether it's around energy, health, manufacturing, or future cities. That's how we package it all up and talk about it and you know, <coughs> make it look more palatable to, the re to, to those who are working outside of the university. Um, and that's how we, um, we communicate that. And then that's just some examples of how we, we actually use the material um, for uh, public consumption. And one of the key things as well is all these materials and handouts and websites that we do. 
is we ensure that there's a regular flow of industrial partners and government officials through the doors of the university to, so that they can see what we're doing, so they can meet industrial partners and we can actually, so the triple helix in action can work. Um, so you've got uh, Professor MacDonald there with Nicola Sturgeon, the Deputy First Minister of Scotland at a health launch. On the top right, you've got David Willits, um, who's uh, the Minister responsible for universities in the UK. Down here, we've got one of our professors, Professor Alistair Florence, with the man on the right here is uh, Dr. Vince Cable, who's the Minister for, um, uh, for Business and Innovation and Skills, referred to earlier. So this, again, is sort of get, building the narrative for them that they understand when they come through the doors that what we do. And then right behind me here, we've got Professor MacDonald and uh, Alex Salmond, the First Minister of Scotland, at the launch of the Technology and Innovation Centre when we came up with the concept and launched it. Um, and at all of these events, our industry partners were there, our government partners were there. And so what we did was we put them all, we put them in the room together and we allow that communication to happen. So these events are uh, extremely helpful for us in that. So they, they showcase what the work that's been going on for months and years before, actually in a sort of simple, straightforward environment. Um, and this one here is, I suppose, the triple, triple, helix, hel triple helix in action. This was a... Um, uh, graduation ceremony, honorary graduation ceremony for six power and energy um, a leaders. They're the three people on either end of the, the row. Um, with Alex Salmond, the First Minister of Scotland, and Professor Sir Jim Macdonald in the centre with his Chancellor's robes on, because it was a formal occasion. So that's Triple Helix in action in terms of um, honouring the work that the, these people in power and energy had done, um, inviting the government along to see the, the, the engagement that we're involved in. And, uh, and ce celebrating the success and uh, marking a moment in time. So that's very important for us. And uh, all of that kind of industry engagement brought us this award in 2012. And that was kind of how we put together that particular award and communicated it about the, the impact we're having on business and industry and the way that we work together. Now, the, um, the story doesn't stand still. Um, and uh, obviously, once you've won the award, that was the communications activity. Again, I'm not expecting you to take all that in. It was about how we actually worked the award and used it to promote the university. And it was the award is the reason I think that I'm standing here today is because of the fact it got us noticed on an international stage. Um, and these are all, you know, some internal communications, international communications. We're doing public engagement activity, public affairs, working with the alumni, um, marketing materials, and what the key messages were. So this was all the kind of, uh, once we'd won, we realized we actually had a campaign to promote the University of the Year um, and, uh, and to tell the world about it and to make it work for us. And again, these are just some examples of what we did. This is some local advertising around the city. Again, about the idea of working with civic pride with, uh, with the city um, and dressing the, the campus to ensure that everybody could, uh, any people who were coming through the campus could see the success that we were having. So that was uh, the, how we celebrated, how we, we marked that. And then how we moved the story on, because that was two years ago, is uh, we uh, engaged an uh, independent economic report into the value of um, our industrial collaborations by a group called Bigger Economics. Um, and they estimated that it's £1.4 billion pounds over the next 10 years will be added to the, the Scottish and UK economy because of Strathclyde's uh, engagement with business and industry. And what we then did, obviously, but that was we marked that, we launched that on the same day that we got to the highest point of our technology and innovation centre. So we did the two things together. So rather than just say, here's the economic report, and then two weeks later, oh, here we've got to the highest point, we, co we put the two things together so that when the building, uh, we had a small ceremony for industrial partners to come to the building and launched this independent report as well to say, this is, you know, look at the impact that we're having. So that's how we moved the story onwards. Um, the entrepreneurial one, which is uh, the most recent event, was more focused around um, this man and the uh, activity that, that uh, he champions at the university. Um, this is Sir Tom Hunter, who is a Strathclyde University uh, graduate. He um, started selling training shoes out the back of a van in Kilmarnock many years ago uh, and built that into a huge um, sports shop empire, which he then sold and became Scotland's richest man. He was worth more than a billion pounds, not quite sure what the exact figure was. Um, and he, um, uh, as part of that, uh, he really believes in Strathclyde and the entrepreneurial, uh, the entrepreneurial way that we, we do things there, um, which is very much in, in tune with what Professor MacDonald does. So this is what uh, 
he says about uh, Strathclyde, the great thing about the University of Strathclyde is that they are open to getting an entrepreneurial mindset through every discipline. That mindset is an attitude, it's about thinking in a different way. Again, it's about useful learning, whether it's staff, students. Um, and um, he also donated some money to create the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship in the year 2000, which is, it's not unique, but it's very unusual in the UK in that it's a, an academic school that uh, tries to teach entrepreneurship. They say, or you, they say that it can't be taught, but certainly if you've got the spark of it in you, um, attendance at, the, um, the, at this particular centre certainly fans the flames and gives you a, a real understanding. Um, and what we do um, in terms of entrepreneurship um, is we base it around this thing called the Strathclyde Entrepreneurial Network, which really essentially is an ecosystem of entrepreneurs. We do everything that we can to support nurturing young talents. So we have student projects from first year students um, working with older students on, on building a small um, a cottage firm. Um, and then that's judged by a group of entrepreneurs every year. And then we've got supporting new ventures. So there's all the spin out activity that we do at the university. Um, celebrate success and then we influence policy. And part of the bid for the uh, Entrepreneurial University of the Year included this fact that we've created more than 50 spin out companies making annual sales of around 80 million etc etc. So it's all part of this idea of it's not just um, the Professor X with his great idea who can spin a company, it's about nurturing the talent right from the moment they come into the university and it's not just the students who are at the Hunter Centre, it's everyone across all the, the university and this is a real um, it's a great key message for the university and is very engaging for industry and for government because this idea that we, we give our students um, an entrepreneurial mindset from the outset, whether they're studying engineering or whether they're studying business, um, that is a uh, part of what we do. And the celebrating success element to that, oh sorry, the, uh, that's, there's three of the more than 50 spin-out companies. We've got uh, Smarter Grid Solutions, Silent Herdsman and uh, Nutricity from a variety of sectors. So obviously it's 11 different sectors that these co companies have been working in. Um, and the celebrating success element to that is every two years we have an annual dinner. Again, the power of events is really strong in getting a message across, really getting everyone in a room at the one time to give them your key messages and tell them about the latest developments in your work is so powerful. And the uh, Entrepreneurial Awards Dinner is uh, organised by the university and we invite all our um, industrial partners, and government, entrepreneur friends, friends of the university, um, and we hand out awards to these you know, first-year students, right through to those who are spinning out companies and making you know, in, in you know, multi-million pound companies. Again, about celebrating the Strathclyde Entrepreneurial Network and the um, and the nature of the entrepreneurial spirit at Strathclyde. So that was uh, the that was the Entrepreneurial Award. And as I think I'm getting towards my time, this is a this is the first award, the research project of the year, which was Hins Light, which basically is ultraviolet light that kills superbugs in hospitals. So this was the first award that we won the research project of the year. And again, the storytelling around that was not about the technology, it was about how the technology is applied and it's dealing with superbugs in hospitals um, and how that caught the imagination of the media and then obviously of the judges in this. Um, so that's how we ended up with these three particular awards. There we are. Um, well, so I've taken the last couple of minutes just to say a wee bit more about the kind of wider context that Strathclyde is working in. Um, which this here is the triple helix, but on a larger scale. And this has been driven a lot by Professor MacDonald. It's the Glasgow Economic Leadership Board um, working, again, academia, industry, and uh, government partners working on these various sectors around the edge, the ones in the square boxes, engineering, design, manufacture, finance, business, services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what we've, we've done at Strathclyde is not just create this kind of, this triple helix for Strathclyde. We're trying to push it out and working with the city and working with the, uh, the Scottish Government in terms of uh, driving economic growth for the whole city and the whole region, the whole of the west of Scotland and beyond. Um, and again, that's part of the collaborative, flexible nature of Strathclyde, is that that's what we do. And this is part of the key messaging for us as well, is about this idea that it's not just about a closed Strathclyde, it's about open, uh, open for business. Um, and from a marketing perspective, part of that is working with the city. Um, and they've just launched a new People Make Glasgow brand and one of the work streams involved in that is um, the city as an education destination, getting students to come to Glasgow to apply to a university in Glasgow, not necessarily Strathclyde, it could be Glasgow, it could be Caledonian University, it could be um, the Glasgow School of Art. Um, what we're doing is working together to make Glasgow an attractive proposition and obviously using the Commonwealth Games, uh, which will be in August um, in the city as a key driver for that. So it's about collaborating together and working. 
with the city and not just uh, with Strathclyde. Now, this is a wee silly thing at the end, which I quite, I quite like. It's part of this part of working with the city and the public realm, making the place more attractive. This is the Graham Hills building, which is one of our less attractive buildings. And working with our partners in, uh, in the city, what we're going to be doing over the next few months is painting uh, two large murals on either end. Part of it is just to kind of uh, make the place more welcoming for the Commonwealth Games, but also about making it more of an attractive proposition for students. And it's about not just about the driving economic growth and all that hard edge stuff, it's about the softer side of things as well and how marketing can, uh, can influence and uh, how this softer thing can make the, the public realm feel more attractive and a better place for students and the public. Um, and then finally, the... Um, to give you an idea of the bandwidth that we're working in at the university, and the kind of, again, it's not just about working with business and industry solely. It's about, on the, the left there, we have a, one of the, Scotland's largest learning and later life programmes. It's about you know, people who maybe never went to university or went to university and are now retired. They can take uh, an evening class or weekend or daytime class um, through this. And this one here, these photographs are ch the Children's University, which is, um, we, had a, we launched Scotland's first Children's University two weeks ago. Um, it's a, a, it's a programme which has been working in England on, in one or two locations um, and it, part of the widening access, useful learning, is that it allows students from uh, deprived backgrounds, or children, to have access to the university or to do learning and to open the doors and open their minds to the idea that university is not a scary, intimidating place and also to get to their parents to let them know that university is all about learning and for the future and it's not somewhere to be intimidated by. So that's, uh, that's Professor Sir Jim there with six of the 70 students who graduated that day. So to sum it all up, as I said at the start, if I'd only had five seconds, that's what I would have said. Um, and that is the rocket fuel to everything that, uh, that Strathclyde does. And um, it's about focusing on the idea of useful learning and being flexible and responsive to the needs of business, industry, government and the, the public sector. And from a communications perspective, it's a, it's a dream, it's a goal. It's, it's fantastic to be able to communicate this um, because it's so crisp and so clear and it really helps us in all that we do. You're just always thinking back, is it about the place of useful learning? Is it about open access? So that is me, and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone may have. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Not a single question. I can start with a warm-up question then. Because you talk about, um, as I understand it from your story, this mm -hmm. is more about meeting people where they are rather than giving them a nice piece of paper. Read about our university. This is about understanding who is my, who do I want to relate to and in what way. You talk about yeah. events and the power of bringing people to one room and... Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that that is part of it. I mean, I think obviously there are many people you, can't, you can never meet. Um, but I think in terms of telling your message to those who you're partnering with, has to be done in close quarters. It has to be done um, in, in rooms like this. You know, events are a good way of celebrating that. But um, it, the working with industry, it's about, um, it's about the flexibility that you get from having a conversation and you understand what their needs are. From a communications perspective, it's, it, the events are very helpful in, in cementing that relationship, but also then about uh, transmitting that message to the wider public um, about whether the uh, economic impact of the university is 1.4 billion, <laughs> or whether it means bricks and mortar, whether it's going to be a new building in their city, or, or whether it's about um, hens light um, technology, which is dealing with superbugs. It's about um, taking that and then trying to spread it as much as possible. But certainly the idea of, of having an open university and, and bringing people together is very important to us. So what do you see as the big challenge? Because as you say, we cannot meet everyone. We had the luxury today to have over 200 people here today. Uh, that is not an everyday luxury that mm. we can afford. Mm. So what are your future challenges for Strathclyde? Well, it's to continue to, uh, to stay true to the useful learning idea um, and uh, to remain flexible um, because you have ch changes in government, changes in, uh, in, in regulatory systems, um, and it's about future scanning, to looking at the horizon to have an idea of what is coming up. Um, what I would say the challenge for people in this room is, is find their own useful learning is what is the institution that you're working for? What are you really about? Can you sum it up? Um, and that's not, I mean, I, as I say at the end, the, the useful learning idea is a gift for us. Um, and it's given to us, it's authentic, because it was given to us by our founder. Um, and um, it's 
what I would challenge people here to do is go away and think about what they are, if they can boil everything down to one simple key message, even if they keep it locally to themselves in their head, it's not something that they have to have you, you know, a endorsement about from the entire institution. Um, but to the challenge is actually understanding what we do, because universities are so wide, they do so many different things, um, but what we have at Strathclyde is this kind of, is this kind of much, narrow, much narrower bandwidth to work within, and so that that's kind of the touch point for everything that we do. Thank you. Anyone else now who has a question? Ooh, plenty of questions. I have uh, some help here. Thank you very much, Lucia. I think it was in the back was first, and then second you have someone on the... Pay it forward. Um, I noticed um, in your presentation that it was um, largely uh, pictures with very little text. I imagine that that was done consciously. Would you like to expand upon your, the way you think when you put together a presentation? Sure. Um, having been sitting where you're sitting many a time, um, I have been blinded by words um, and PowerPoint with lots and lots and lots of text on it. Um, and I have always found the more effective um, presentations that I have um, been at are the ones where you are more focused on what the listener is saying rather than spending, you know, listening and reading and listening and reading. So it's about the way that I like to communicate to an audience, um, and a, I find that that's the, the most powerful uh, and most effective way of, of doing it, and it's about... Um, part of it is the storytelling. It's when you're talking about you know, storytelling, it's, it's words and pictures together. So if I said the University of Glasgow looks like you know it's a Gothic building and it's got a tower, and you know I can do all that just by showing you the photograph. And then if I contrast that with the way that the University of Strathclyde looks, you know it might take me three or four minutes to try and explain how the, the two of them look differently, and I can do it like that with two photographs. So that's kind of the way that I I, I approach the presentation, and uh, I hope you appreciated that. Uh, that's the way I, I took it. From the Twitter flow, I can see that it was much appreciated. So, let's see here. And we had a second question over there. And yes. Oh, we have some high jumping going on, or triathlon, or something. Hi. Um, be very interested to know in terms of resources, um, your, your staff, the communications department, mm. marketing department. Could you tell us a little bit more about yeah, how many staff do you have, etc.? Okay. Um, well, the communications department, we have um, a communications manager and a three communications officers. Um, we have a web team of four. Um, we have an events team of three. Um, and we have a publications team uh, who deal with the publications, but they, they're the ones that do all the branding, all the, 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 the logos you, you see. Um, of four, so you're looking at about 16 to 20 people um, in total, which is fairly generous. Um, but certainly, even looking around the Scottish higher education system, there are universities with far larger um, a communications offices than, than that. Obviously, we could always do more with more people, um, but what we, uh, what we have that the others don't have is the idea of useful learning, and I think that's what gives us um, and the, the culture of the, of the university, which isn't to do with the, the communications department, we just happen to be within that place. Um, that really gives us the, um, the, the added uh, step. Um, I, you know, when I joined uh, three years ago, um, getting to know the university, uh, the, the potential for um, taking the idea of useful learning and working with it and demonstrating it was, uh, was very strong. It, it was obvious and it was, uh, I was really thrilled that they were so clear. And again, that comes back to our principal who um, really focused the strategy. Um, and I mean, this is this, his, uh, the focus in the strategy was focusing on the academics and the work that they're doing. And we're just following behind and supporting that and communicating what they're doing. Um, so it's a, it's a fair sized team, but certainly um, it's certainly not the biggest that, uh, that is in higher education in Scotland. We have time for one more question. Yes, we have one. Hello. I wonder, how do you communicate to you, uh, the younger citizens in Glasgow? Do you cooperate with the, like science festivals or science centres? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, Glasgow has a, a large science centre. Um, and uh, coincidentally enough, the chairman of Glasgow Science Centre is Professor Sir Jim MacDonald. Oh. 
because he sees the connectivity between the things that we do and the things that the Science Centre does and the things that government and industry. So Jim is a, is one step ahead of everyone else in seeing where these links are. So it's about working with the Science Centre um, on their uh, exhibitions and on the Science Festival in June um, and ensuring that our academics are there and that people are understanding part of it. And then um, the Children's University, which was at the end there, part of that will be at the Science. Uh, some of the credits for the Children's University will be participating in the Science Festival and activities. So again, it's that the, everyone working together for the benefit of mankind, as John Anderson said, and, uh, and, and seeing that connectivity and not building walls around the university, it's about knocking them down and making people work together in partnership. Um, so yeah, we're very, as, you know, through Jim McDonald, we're very plugged into our science uh, centre and our science festival.